Now back in the 90s, a couple of fuel systems engineers were talking and they knew that to uh, have better atomization, they were going to have to have higher injection pressures. And that thought train was the very beginning of what we know as the common rail system today. And the story goes that one of the engineers that was, uh, they were having dinner together, a couple of them, one of them started drawing on his dinner napkin and that uh, napkin and the, the picture that he drew on it is supposedly at the engine company today framed. And he drew a crude version of the very first caps pump. And I think that he got credit for uh, designing that high pressure system. So uh, that was the ISC CM850. That was the first engine to have a the very first early common rail system, if you will. But it was still an injection pump, and we're going to take a quick look at it here. And here is our caps pump. The caps pump is a modular pump. That means that you could buy it as an assembly, or you could buy pieces of it. Those blue lines that you see are the separation of the pieces or modules. So one module is number two, that's called the accumulator module. And then number three is the cam housing module. Number 12 is the gear pump module. Number seven is a distributor module. And number six is the injection control valve module. Those are your main modules. In the later generations of the pump, number six and seven became one module and you couldn't buy them separately. The accumulator up on top, if you took it off the pump, in the bottom of it, it had two cylinders that stuck out about an inch and a half. And they were the um, class fit barrels for the high pressure pumping pistons. The high pressure pumping pistons looked just like two steel cigarettes, but about two thirds as long as a, as a normal cigarette. Then in the cam housing, there was large springs with tappets on them and the tappets, they were roller tappets and they went down and they sat on the cam lobes in the cam housing. The cam housing number three had two large lobes on it and the lobes were triangular shaped. So in one revolution of the pump, you got six actual pumping cycles. But mind you, the, the pumping pistons, they probably only moved about 200 thousandths of an inch. Because remember, we're making extremely high pressure, but very low flow. Up on the very top of number two, the accumulator housing, are two big solenoids. Number one, and then to the right of it is the second one. They are controlled by the ECM, and there was a click test you could do in a diagnostic test in Insight software to see if they were uh, good or bad. If they made a clicking noise when you turn the test on, they were considered to be functioning. And those uh, two pumping valves are what would allow the pressure that went, the gear pump pressure that went into the pumping chambers with those steel cigarettes I talked about, or pumping pistons, those two check valves, number one and the one behind it, if, if they closed, then the fuel that went into that pumping piston when it was down was trapped in there and it would be forced into the accumulator. If they opened, that fuel could go into the return, which was number nine. That's actually a return fitting up on top of there. And then the fuel would run back to the second number nine in the back of the pump. Those are both labeled nine because they're the return pump fuel out of the pump uh, to help cool it and just to get rid of the uh, excess fuel that wasn't being used to make pressure. In the back of the accumulator, number four is the, they called it the snubber fitting. 
It's a very high pressure check valve. Off of that is steel line number five. You can see that yellowish line that curves around. Line number five is a very long line that's twisted. You never bend it. It's bolted to the pump by bracket number 10 in special nylon sleeves because it vibrates. Uh, that line, whenever the injector fires, it, uh, the fuel pressure in the accumulator would travel through that line and then into the back of that fitting at the bottom of the top, at the top of the distributor, go up into number 60 injection control valve. The ECM would fire that when it was ready. Basically, that was just a piston in a cylinder that covered a hole. When the ECM fired up a magnetic coil, it pulled the piston back, the hole opened and the fuel pressure was able to go down and into the distributor number seven. And those blue caps on the back on the bottom were the fuel lines that went to the injectors. So the uh, distributor number seven, all it had was a rotating cylinder with holes drilled in it and it would allow the fuel pressure from the injection control valve to line up to the right hole at the right time so that the right injector got fuel. Number six, the injection control valve was fired by the ECM. You'll see number eight, that was a timing resistor uh, that basically told the ECM the latency of the magnet that was uh, pulling that plunger open to fire it. The ECM needed to know that so that it could control timing better. And this was an electromechanical pump. There was a fuel pressure sensor in it, a fuel temperature sensor. They were a combo sensor early on, but later on they come and split those into two sensors, the temperature and the pressure sensor, because the combo sensor uh, didn't have that, well, that good of a service life. They tended to fail. Once they split the sensors up, um, the, their problems went away with that. So this is the CAPS pump, very early common rail system. And those engines are still running today. A lot of these engines were in box trucks, a lot of freight trucks. They were in a lot of transit buses. And some of them were even put in case tractors. One of the guys at work had a case tractor that had one of these engines in it with this pump. And that was called the Cummins CAPS fuel system. Thanks for joining me at Neural Splendor.